It's good to see you guys. Uh, I'm Nathan, and our senior pastor, Rod, and his wife, Glenna, they're, um, they're down in Texas today, so y'all get me two weeks in a row, which is, you know, it is what it is, so you guys can bear with me, and uh, you'll get through it. Don't worry, you'll get through it. But the uh, title of my message this morning is Know the Difference. Know the Difference, and it's about revealing and overcoming Satan's tactics. So last week, uh, it was interesting because somehow I transposed a word, conviction, and condemnation. And my wife's like, we get home and she goes, did you realize that you said... um, condemnation instead of conviction, and I'm like, what? Uh-uh. Because those, those two things, they are different, and the difference is very important. The difference is very important. And so I was like, no way, man. Surely I didn't do that, you know? But then, then my mind immediately went to, you know what? This is going to be a great opportunity. What the devil meant for, uh, for bad God's going to turn it around and use for good because what, what he was thinking he was going to try to do and trip everybody up and make them go, well, surely that's not right. The word doesn't say that, you know, whatever. Now I'm going to focus on it. Now I'm going to just bring it out, you know. We're really going to drive the point home. So whatever, Satan. All right. So like I said, we're going to be covering conviction versus condemnation. So let's pray. Holy Spirit, help us to know the difference. Amen. <clears throat> so, one of the verses that I used last week was John uh, three seventeen through 21. Um, but I'm just going to cover verses 17 and 18. And it says, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned But whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. So, you know, last week I went on and I was like, you know, God doesn't convict us. Satan convicts us. And I'm like, how in the world does that happen? How how does it go from here to here and change? (laughs) You know what I mean? But let's look at the definitions. We're just going to cover the definitions real quick. Conviction is a formal declaration that someone is guilty of something, the verdict of a jury or the decision of a judge in a court of law. That's conviction. Somebody that's guilty of something. Condemnation, the expression of very strong disapproval, the action of condemning someone to a punishment or sentencing them. That's condemnation. Which one sounds more like our God? Someone that's, that lets you know, hey, something needs changed. Which one sounds more like the enemy that's constantly whispering into your ear? Condemnation, that disapproval, that conviction, the one that, or the uh, condemnation that's, that's saying you are guilty and you're going to pay the price for it. Who here knows that that Jesus paid the price for us. Thank you, Jesus. People are like, why do you have this picture up up here? This picture of Jesus up on the front seat. It's because he paid the price. The whole reason we're getting together here is for him. And he's not going around condemning you. That's not what he does. Guys, I'm going to get way deep into this today. But I want to tell you something. The Holy Spirit convicts believers of righteousness. The Holy Spirit convicts us of righteousness. What that means is He's coming and He's reminding us of the righteousness that we are in Jesus Christ, through what Jesus Christ has done. The Holy Spirit doesn't come and convict us of all of these sins. The Holy Spirit doesn't condemn us for sins because That's not his job. That's not what he does. God doesn't do that because we are different than the world. Let's point some stuff out here. So, 
John 16, 8 through 11. If you have your Bibles, turn there. If you have your phones and you've got the Bible app, pull it up if you don't have your Bible. If you don't have the Bible app, download it on your phone because you've always got it. And the Word of God is your sword. Take it with you. Take it with you wherever you go. John 16, 8 through 11. Everybody there? Yeah, yeah. I knew you were. And when he, the Holy Spirit, has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they do not believe in me. This is Jesus talking. Because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness... Because I go to my Father, and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. There's two different people that he's talking to here. Two different people groups. One is the world, unbelievers. He's talking about the unbelievers, but he's talking to his disciples. To his believers, people that believe in him. Stay with me here, okay? Hear me out, because this truly will set you free. This will set you free. Grasp it, okay? Hold on to it. The Holy Spirit never convicts a believer of his sins. You're going, Briggs. You're out of your mind, dude. That's not truth. That is truth, and I challenge every single one of you in here. Every one of you, I challenge you. To find a scripture in the Bible that tells you that the Holy Spirit has come to convict believers of their sins. To convict believers of their sins. Try to find it. If you can, come and chat with me. Come and chat with me. You see, we've been living in this state of, of defeat because of misunderstanding what the Word says. Because we think that it says one thing. Why do we think that it says that he, that he comes to convict us of our sins? Because he's constantly condemning us. He's constantly trying to speak these lies into our, into our ears, pump it into our brains, that, that we're not worthy, that, we have cre- that we've done all these sins, that God won't love us, that God can't love us. Why would God love us? We're constantly hearing him, and we choose who we're going to listen to. And most of the time, whenever we feel that we are these horrible, wretched sinners because we're hearing that all the time, then we don't hear what the Holy Spirit is actually convicting us of, and that is our righteousness in Christ Jesus. That's what he's convicting us of. But we're overhearing, we're hearing Satan louder condemning us of our sins, so we think that, well, that must be the Holy Spirit. It's not. It's not. Read the verse, and read the verse in context as well. Please read it in context. So, the Holy Spirit actually is in us to convict us of our righteousness in Christ Jesus. That's why he's literally in us. That's why he's in us. Verse says, the ministry of the Spirit to unbelievers is that of conviction. Specifically, he uses their unbelief to prove the gravity of sin in verse 9. The triumphant work of Christ to prove the availability of righteousness. Verse 10, it says, in the defeat of Satan to prove that the solemn um, certainty of judgment. This whole, this whole verse that I just read, each different each different verse has a totally different, like, it's, he's laying it out and showing us what that is. He's showing us what he's meaning and what he's talking about here. So even when you fail, the Holy Spirit is with us to remind us that the blood of Jesus has made you totally forgiven and righteous. The blood of Jesus did that. We didn't do that. I didn't do it for myself. You didn't do it for yourself. You can't do it for yourself. Why do we want to hold on to this stuff? 
Why do we want to feel like that we have to work to be, to be made righteous, to be made holy, to earn our way into heaven? It's simply stinking impossible. It's impossible. That's why he died on the cross for us. That's the whole point. Remember who the Holy Spirit is. Remember who the Holy Spirit is. Remember what he does. He's our helper. He helps us. Jesus says, it's better that I go so that the helper will come. Does the helper, do do you think of a helper in your mind as somebody that's going to go around condemning you? Constantly convicting you of sin? Constantly bringing that stuff up? No, I don't. If I want somebody to help me, that's not what I think of. That's simply not what I think of. The Holy Spirit, he leads us and he guides us. He gently leads us. He gently guides us. He doesn't slam the hammer down on us. That's not who he is. He gently leads us and guides us and directs us into all truth. Remember. Remember the importance of context. To read as you're reading the word, keep it in context. You've got the content, yes. It's so easy for your mind to just, as you're reading through, oh, this means this, this means this, whatever. But you don't think about it. That's why we're supposed to study the word, devour the word. Look at each individual word and what it actually means. Learn what it means. Learn what it means. Who are these verses talking about here? Was Jesus talking about believers or unbelievers in John 16, 8 through 11? Let's look at it. When Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would come to convict the world of sin because they do not believe in him, is he talking about believers? He can't be talking about believers because we believe in him. So he's talking about the world. He's convicting the world. The world is convicted of sin, not us. It's clear that he was referring to unbelievers. The Holy Spirit doesn't convict the world of sins. Does does your Bible say sins? Plural? No, it's singular. It says that he comes to convict the world of sin. And then it goes on and tells us what that sin is. It's unbelief, the sin of rejecting Jesus and not believing in his finished work. That's what it's talking about. That's what it's talking about whenever the Holy Spirit comes to convict the world of sin. Of sin. That sin is unbelief, not believing that Jesus truly did finish the work that he came to do. Jesus says that the Holy Spirit convicts you, you and me, us, of righteousness. Isn't it? I want to bounce around up here. Like, I can't hardly contain it because once we grasp this, once we understand what what he's talking about here, he convicts us, he reminds us, he, he lays it out for us of our righteousness through Christ Jesus. That's what he's doing. That is amazing. He says, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Man, that is, that's awesome. He's clearly saying, you. Jesus was referring to us, his believers. This tells us that the Holy Spirit was sent to convict believers of righteousness and not of sin. He convicts the world of of their sin. He convicts us of righteousness, reminding us, stay here, stay focused. You have been made righteous, here we go, by your faith. For righteousness is not doing right, but right standing before God, because you are of your right believing. Because of your right believing. Are you hearing me? That's what makes us righteous. It's not because you're doing right, it's because you're believing right. And once you believe right, and you're focused on Him, you're going to do right. Right. You know, you might be like, well, this, this flesh keeps doing all kinds of ridiculous stuff. 
Keep focused. Keep focused on him. Don't let Satan twist your thoughts around. Don't let the sin of this world constantly keep you focused on it. Let the Holy Spirit do his job and convict you of the righteousness that you are and remind you of what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross. If you're constantly focused on these sins, on the things that we do, every single one of us do, believe me, we all do. Nobody wants anybody else to know about our sins. But I'll tell you what, I'm pretty transparent. You hang out with me long enough, you can find out I'm not perfect. You know what? But I'm not going to sit there and focus on it. I'm going to focus on him, and the more that I do, the more that I'm going to look like him. That's how he's going to make us righteous, okay? By believing in him, that he is who he says that he is, that he does in us what he says he's going to do in us, that he has done for us already. Guys, this is is outstanding. So when when you miss it, the Holy Spirit comes to convict and remind you that you are the righteousness of God because of Jesus Christ. When you miss it, when you get off track, when you start going this way and you're looking over here and looking over there, that's why he's here. That's why he's right here inside of us, to help get us right back on track, to help convict us of righteousness. So he reminds you of the main clause of our new covenant, that God will be merciful to you, to your unrighteousness and your sins and your lawless deeds. He will remember no more. Look up Hebrews 8.12. If you want a reminder, look up Hebrews 8.12. It literally tells us that he will be merciful to our unrighteousness. And our sins, our lawless deeds, he's not going to remember them anymore. Why? Because of what Jesus did. What he did, it's done. He did it. Man, I, I, I want to go. I want to go over here. I need to stay here. Friends, the Holy Spirit, he absolutely is our helper. John 14, 16, you'll find that he is our helper. He was sent to live in you and to help you not to point out all of your faults. That's not what he does. To help you by convicting you of your everlasting righteousness in Christ Jesus. Everlasting. Remember a couple weeks ago whenever I was preaching about um, uh, the courts of heaven and how Satan stands there trying to uh, constantly condemn? He's literally in front of, of God the Father trying to condemn us in the courts of heaven. And it says that Jesus is our representative, is our attorney that says, nope. Wrong. My blood covered that. What I did took care of that. This is what I'm talking about right here. John 14, 16. That's that's where it's at, man. That's where it's at. Everlasting righteousness in Christ Jesus. And some of you are probably thinking, Briggs, you think you can't lose your salvation and all that stuff? And man, that we can go on and on with that. We can go on and on with that. But I'm telling you, Jesus gave us the Holy Spirit to convict us of our righteousness. And those words came straight out of the mouth of Jesus Christ. Red letters, baby. (laughs) You can't deny it. You can't deny it. God's inexhaustible grace in our life and the power of the cross can only be understood with the revelation that the Holy Spirit brings to us. It's got to be a revelation too. It's got to be a revelation. The reason I say that is because we, we are so fixated on ourselves. We're so focused on ourselves. We have to allow the Holy Spirit to reveal to us what Jesus is saying right here. As an example, think about the disciples. Think about how many times Jesus had to say this, 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 over and over and 
over. And as we're reading, it's like a, it's, it's linear, you know, so we're hearing him say things over and over and over. But they were with him for three and a half years, but still, we're like, you know, come on, boys, get it together. And, and, and so we kind of think that for ourselves sometimes, but God, God doesn't, he's not us. He doesn't view things the way we do. Think about our children and the things that, that our children do sometimes, and we're like, goodness sakes, how many times do I have to tell you life will be so much easier if you clean your room, if you do the dishes, if you do what I say? Fortunately, God doesn't think the way we do. God has this, this inexhaustible grace and it's because of, of Jesus and what he did. He can have that inexhaustible grace for us. That amazing mercy in the Holy Spirit saying, remember? Remember what Jesus did? Remember? This is who he is. This is why he did it. Because he loves you more than anything you could possibly fathom. Keep your mind fixed on him. Um, Joseph Prince, I don't know if, uh, if you guys listen to a bunch of different teachers and stuff. I do. I listen to a lot of different teachers. And you know what? I take the good from some, and I leave what I don't necessarily like. There are so many teachers out there, so many even, even leaders, pastors, that will go out and just start bashing other pastors and other ministries. If I had hair, I would rip it out. Because it, it just drives me nuts. We have hundreds of different divisions of Christianity. I'm going, what is happening here? Why can believers not just be believers? Why can't we just follow the way? Why do we have to talk bad about all these other pastors and preachers and teachers. That's not our job. Nowhere is that our job. Our job is to draw people in and, and draw them closer to the Father. Draw them closer to His love so that they can have that relationship. But if we're going around slapping other people, you know, trying to block other people from going to them and listening to them, well, what in the world? How does that look like Christ? It doesn't in any way, shape, or form. You know, so I say that because part of this, uh, this teaching and what I'm bringing you, um, Joseph Prince does a really great job of breaking it down in a, in a devotional, I guess it's kind of a devotional book called Reign in Life. Um, and if you're willing to listen to other teachers and stuff, listen to it, you know, because... There's a lot of people that have a lot to bring. If you only come here and try, to, and try to learn from us everything that you need to learn in this walk with Christ, you're not going to get it. You're not going to get everything you need. We need one another. We need one another. And that even means if you're listening to other teachers or other preachers or going to other churches every now and then or whatever, if God's calling you to go to another church, go to another church. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. You know, not going not gonna to break our hearts or, or, you know, hurt our feelings. And if you know other people that need to come here, let them come here. Invite them here. Because they're definitely going to get some different stuff than they're going to get other places. That's for sure. I wanted to share a dream that I had with you guys. I had it on April 12th at about four in the morning. And you guys know that sometimes God talks to me at, at weird times of the morning. And I immediately knew that this was a, a dream that I needed to be able to share with you guys. I wanted to have all the finite details worked out before I got up here. To be quite honest with you, I've been stressing about it a little bit. I'm like, God, I know you want me to bring this dream today. I think I know what it means, but I'm not 100% sure. And I'm, I was thinking, literally, I thought, he'll tell me right before I get up there. Guess what? He didn't. 
So I'm just going to tell you the dream. A little scary. A little scary, I got to tell you. Not the dream. The dream isn't scary. But me telling you without fully knowing is a little scary for me. But so be it. So in this dream, you've had these dreams that are like super vivid. You know, they're like, like they're real, like you're really right there in it. It was, it was one of these dreams. And picture this. I'm on this really fast moving train, but it like has an open top. And so there's, everybody's able to like look around at everything. And the scenery was gorgeous. I mean, it was amazing, breathtaking. We were way up in the mountains, almost like a, a scene from like Narnia or something like that, you know, just like super vivid, gorgeous, huge peaks and, and cliffs and snow covered mountains and stuff. And, and we're on this train. And I mean, it is screaming down through here. There were a lot of people on this train, lots of people. It was a huge train, huge. And there was a lot of people that I knew, but most of them I didn't know. And so in this dream, I knew where we were. I knew we were going somewhere. I can't tell you for 100% sure where it was, but I knew where we were going at the time. And I had a piece about it. Like I knew this is exactly where we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be right here, right now some of these people that were with me were like family members and stuff. And we started coming through this, this, this pass, you know, like it starts to open up. And then imagine this, this giant bridge, you know, that has the big, the big round openings. And I mean, we're just screaming through there and the smoke's coming up off the top and, and I'm looking around and then way down, way down, hundreds of feet down is this gorgeous, blue water, like just this amazing blue water. And you can see the sheer cliffs, these granite cliffs that are going down into this, into this water. And, and it's, it's interesting because there's not like any beaches. All of it is coming down and, and you just see these huge waves like crashing up against the sides of these sheer cliffs. And as I'm looking down there, it's a sunny day, it's gorgeous, and all of a sudden, I see people start jumping off this train into the water. Like, and we're talking hundreds of feet down. And I look, and around me, like, several people have on life vests. But we're on a train, you know? Like, nobody, nobody got on the train at the beginning. And in case of a water landing, you can use your seat as a flotation device. No, there was none of that. We're on a train. That doesn't exist, you know what I mean? But these people had life vests on. They were like these orange life vests, you know, that you get that are like real cheap, and they got the deal on the back, and you strap them on, snap them, and, and they're not comfortable at all, especially for somebody without hair. They're not comfortable. I didn't have on a life vest. And I'm looking at these people that have on these life vests, and the people that had on life vests are the ones that are jumping off this train, and I'm like, what are you doing? Because I knew where we were going. Why would you jump off the train that's taking us where we're going? Is what's going on in my mind. I'm like, this is, this is unreal. And some of my family even had these life vests on. And then this one person jumped. And, and in my dream, I was just like, no. And I, I knew that the people, if, if they jump, there's no beach. There's... There's no surviving this. Even if you survive the hundreds of feet fall into the water, if you survive that, you're still, you're not going to make it. The waves are slamming into this granite wall like you can't really see it that well from way up here. But if, if you look, you understand that's what's happening. And I'm like, no, if you, if you jump, you die. And so this person jumps and I immediately, out of, out of reaction, out of, out of a, a desire and a need to save them, like, I jumped. I'm like, maybe there's some way I can help the, this person, you know? So anyway, so 
So people are jumping, and I jump. And I knew. I knew they'd be beat to death on these, on these cliffs, you know, on the rocks. And it was, it was uh, very devastating. So this person jumps, and I jump. And as we hit the water, we kept sinking really fast. It was, it was not like hitting normal water. You know, whenever you normally hit the water, you go down a little bit, but your body's buoyant. You know, so you start to, you start to float back up. And we're sinking really fast. And I remember looking up, and people are hitting the water. And it looked like, you know, have you ever seen in a movie or something where somebody's under the water and, and somebody's up there shooting and you see these bullets? Choo, 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 choo. That's what it looked like as I'm looking up. And we just kept sinking really fast. Even the people that had on these life vests that are supposed to whoop, pull them right back up, didn't make any difference. They were sinking as fast as I was and I didn't have one. And we're sinking like way down under the water, totally, totally farther than normal. And these people... They put their faith in these life vests that were designed to help save them whenever they went into water, but they were useless. They weren't doing anything for them. Many, many of the people that had these life vests on, they were extremely frantic, and many of them were starting to drown under the water, not being able to make it back up to the top. And I was just like, what is going on, man? Why are these people doing this? I was pretty certain, looking up, I remember I was about 75 feet under the water, and I remember thinking, if I swim real hard right now, I might be able to make it to the top. I might be able to survive this deal. But then I look over, And maybe from me to that back wall was the person that I jumped off the train for. And this person, now, it's not not an actual person, but the face of this person looked like all three of my daughters in one person. That's the only, the only way that I can describe this person. It, she very much resembled all three of my daughters in one person. Very odd. Because all three of my daughters look totally different. Totally different. So I was looking at this one. And I realized that where she was, she was up next to the, next to the rock cliff. She was about 75 feet down under the water and she couldn't go up or down. Like she's stuck there, moving, trying to to move, but she couldn't go up or down. Remember, I'm 75 feet under the water. I'm a decent swimmer, but nevertheless, I knew if I start swimming hard, I could probably make it to the top. But in my mind, I see her and she's stuck. So I immediately swam to her as fast and as hard as I could. And I get to her, and I'm trying to evaluate the situation. Why is she not able to go up or down? Well, that little strap that you bring around, you snap. It was long, and it got caught in a little crack in the rock. So when she was going up or down, whatever the force was, stuck that thing in the rock. And so I thought, I've got to break her free. If I break her free, I can at least shove her to the top as hard as I possibly can, and she might be able to make it. She's got fear and terror and, and disbelief in her, in her mind. But the one thing that she was putting her hope and her faith and her trust in to save her life, this life vest, was the one thing that was holding her under the water so that she couldn't get free. That one thing was holding her under the water. So I grab it, and I'm pulling on it, and I'm trying to get it off. I'm trying to get it out of this crack, and I realize you're not going to get it out of this crack. There's nothing you can do right now to get that out of the crack. So I thought, fine, rip this vest off of her and shove her up. Try to take her up as hard as I can. So I'm trying to rip it off of her. I'm trying as hard as I can, and I'm looking in her eyes, and I can't get it off of her. 
at this point, there's no return for me. No matter what, there's no way I'm going to get there. I've expended too much oxygen. It's not going to happen. But I'm trying so frantically to get her out of this thing. And I look at her, and in her eyes, they were filled with terror and surprise and unbelief. And, and it was just like, how, how did this happen? You know, that was the look in her eyes. And right then I realized that the time was up. It was over. And there was nothing I could do. And I, it went black. And I woke up grasping for air. Like that whole... <gasps> just like, what in the world? Like I said, I don't have it figured out. I don't know exactly what it means. But when I have these kinds of dreams, whenever I have these dreams that, that God tells me this is from me, um, I just, I'm obedient. I try to write it down immediately. And there's been some other, there's been prophecies about Church on the Rock and how God has said that, that he is the train that's coming through. Literally, a prophecy about a train coming through. You can get on the train. You can get out of the way and watch it pass by, or you can get run over by the train. But those are your options. We were on this train, so I do feel the, the prophetic connection there. And I, I think that it's interesting that the people were already on the train and chose to jump off the train because something looked like what they wanted, like what they felt like was going to be great and awesome for them. They were even prepared for it with a life jacket. But then when they get there, they realize it's not going to help, and this isn't going to turn out like you think it's going to. It's not going to look like what you think it's going to look like. God has us where he wants us. He's taking us where he wants us. And if you jump off, things aren't going to end up like you think they're going to end up. It may look great. The free fall may be beautiful. Believe me, I love free fall, and I love skydiving, all that stuff. But it's, it's not going to end up right, you know? It's going to lead to death and destruction. And what you think, that little safety blanket that you're holding on to, hoping and praying that it does its job, isn't going to do its job. And you're going to die because you separated yourself from what God truly has for you. I'm not going to get into what I think the, uh, the vision of it being related to my, my daughters and all that stuff. There's a lot that I have to process through there. All of you, I'm sure, are going, yep, there's a lot you've got to process through there, bro. Um, so be praying for me about that. Um, Michael came up to me before service and, and had something that, that he wanted to speak to us that God has been putting on his heart. Um, so before we go any further, Michael, would you mind coming up and sharing that with us, brother? <laughs> when I retired 12 years ago, I was in the habit of just waking up naturally early because I'd been doing it for 35, 40 years and, and, uh, days off, I couldn't sleep in if I wanted to and. And holidays, I was awake, whether, you know. But these last 12 years, <clears throat> I've gotten out of the habit of that. And if I get up before 8 o'clock, it's a pretty good day, you know. So when God woke me up a little after 5 this morning and, and put it on my heart to, for, to go over something that I'd seen before, or just, just the other day, he, uh, um, I just want to tell you what he said now. I know I've shared this before, but but if I have a theme or a base for things God wants me to share with people, it's it stays the same. Some people have a um, uh, a heart to share faith or healing or you know just different things, and and that really shows me the importance of each part of the body. Each one has a part to give to the rest of the body. 
And what God seems to speak to me, and I know I've said this before, but it's how, how good he is and how much he loves us. The goodness of God and the love of God is just, we can never fully understand and know that. The second thing is who we are in Christ and then who Christ is in us. And I want to read something in Ephesians, if I may. No, I'm, I'm, I'm good if that's all right. It's Ephesians 2. I'm going to start in verse 17. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were. I'm going backwards. The, the last verse I read is the one I really want to come to. But I, like you said, I, I like reading things in context. If you take the text out of the context, all you're left with is a con. Just a little thing there. Okay. And he came and preached peace to those who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both, we and Jesus, have our access in one spirit to the Father. The death of that is pretty cool to me. But anyway, okay. For th- so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom, this is what I want you to get, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. I shared with Rod last Sunday a little bit about how I just, I've, I've got this this thing going on. I've, I've, I've had it before, and I probably just ignored it. But it's like I'm just re- or we, not, just, not I, but we're just ready to go around a corner and see what is next. Or we're coming to a door, and, and we've even turned the knob, but we just haven't open that door up quite yet. You follow where, where I'm going? It's just like there's not an anticipation and an expectancy of there's something coming on. And Rod's been, been, been encouraging us to pray for a, a new revival and, a, and, and signs and wonders. And, I, and, and that's, that's just it. That's what's, that's, that is when the presence of God really comes in, in in with us. And here it is telling us that in the Spirit and through Jesus, we are, are being built, not have been or might be able to or will be built in the future, but we are building, being built together into a dwelling of God, a place that God dwells. And that's, that's, that's what he wants us to really understand that his presence isn't just a bunch of goosebumps or, you know, a little feeling. It is an indwelling. The old covenant, it was a habitation. The Spirit of God came down and our visitation. In the new covenant, it's a habitation. He lives inside of us. And another thing I wanted to just real quick is that I grew up in, in the Christian, in the, in the church in the 60s and 70s and 80s where the Lord's a gentleman, and we don't do anything that's extreme or out of character of what we believe. And I, I want to say to you now, I believe God is telling us that it's time to step out of that and to be extreme. Uh, it's the extreme worship that is going to pull that, that, that visitation, that, 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 that thing, thing in, in our body so that each, each one that has a, a word or a song or a message that's going to come about. And I look over at Jesse and I see, I see somebody that is and is learning to be more extreme than I've ever been in my life. And, and it's working through him, and I envy that ability to just, I mean, it's not that I totally ignore God. There's been times he's told me to do something, and I've, I've, I've been obedient but not to the point that our brother over here is, and I, I really honor 
what God is doing in you. And, and uh, others that, that, that get a little more exuberant in their worship, praise God for them. Because God is wanting an extreme worshiper. He doesn't want a complacent worshiper. I think the, our enemy is okay with us being complacent in our worship. Yeah, yeah, praise the Lord. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he does not want us to get excited and worship our Lord exuberantly and extremely. Be ready for the extreme. It's coming. And I would like to uh, um, encourage everybody to, to just to, uh, be open to that. I, I never, I try my best not to ever tell anybody what to do. That's not what God has called me to do. I just try to encourage people and to um, let you know I love you. And there's another thing you said about the, about the um, other places to get teaching from and uh, other teachers or other ministries. I'm not saying that we should separate ourselves from here. I heard the old thing that, that, if the thumb does not want to be part of the body, and it separates itself from the body that it's, it's attached to, and it drops to the sidewalk, who's going to die? The body's going to be hurt, but that thumb's going to die. So we don't want to separate ourselves. But at the same time, I liken it to a, to a if you like fish, the, the best type of fish that you like. Let's say a, a nice walleye fillet, Okay. If you never had walleye, you're missing out on it. But if you happen to find a bone in that walleye fillet, are you going to throw the whole plate away? No. You pick that bone out, you set it aside, and you enjoy the meat. Likewise, an old alligator gar that you catch down the Missouri River is full of gristle and bone and tough hide. And But if you look for, and if you're willing to ignore the tough stuff, there's still nutritional meat in that gar. So even somebody that we don't agree with, that looks different from us, that, uh, help me, Lord, that, that teaches things mostly in a different way, God can still show you something in what they're saying and what they're doing. So don't, ex- don't, don't, don't throw anything away until God tells you to throw it away. I love you all. Thank you. Good stuff. Thank you, Michael. I love how the Holy Spirit allows us to each fulfill different areas, you know, and and just because God didn't give me the interpretation of that dream. I just found out that God did give one of you the interpretation of the dream, and I love that we have people that are that are bold enough to get up here and, and share the word, share what God has has spoken to them, you know. And and Michael, he's kind of hard on himself, but that dude does. He's very obedient. He does do what God tells him to do, and. Uh, Sometimes what God tells us to do isn't going to look like what he tells everybody else to do, right? Because I'm not you, you're not me, you're not that person, that person isn't you, whatever. You know, but God calls us each to be obedient to what he's telling you to do. And so, uh, Jesse, would you come on up and share that uh, the revelation that God gave you? Bill, you got him? Hello, hello. <clears throat> Love what you said. Um, but what's really, what, what I like to wrap my head around um, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, the definition of extreme is what's going on now, but really it's not extreme Christianity, it's normal Christianity because we get a chance to, to get pushed and moved and go. So when he was saying about extreme Christianity, we can all be extreme Christians because what in your head is extreme? Talking to that person at the gas pump, that seems extreme. Go ahead and do it. There's an idea that God's going to give you off of what you just said. That's extreme. That sounds extreme. Extreme to me 
is just a little bit different what extreme is to other people. But my extreme started as your extreme when I started. So I just want to encourage you in that big time because my extreme was very small. Now there's nothing that I, I don't think that I would ever go and do. So you can all get to that point, and you guys are at that point. You just have to step and do it. Um, I love dreams. Dreams are super wonderful, super, super wonderful. Um, and I feel like I have an interpretation for Nathan's dream. I could feel like I could just see it in my head uh, when you were doing it. So take it or leave it, put it on a shelf, take what you want. There's, uh, like he was saying about the alligator guy, I love it. There's uh, something I say in my head is there is 10, 10 things about somebody, and maybe only one of them's good. Let's, let's draw out that one thing. Let's not focus on nine other things because God's working on those nine other things. And if we can pull out that one thing that is good, then there's going to be two things that are good, then three things, and then we get to celebrate because now there's four things that are good about that person. So I just wanted to touch on that again. Um, okay, so in, in this dream to me, um, the train represented the ministry. Um, and then when you said that Church of the Rock had something with trains, I've heard that again, but I forgot it while I was sitting there. So praise God, that's confirmation that it's on the right track. So the train is moving fast, just when it's on this track. And when a train is on a track, it's going to where that track is. So we're on track with God. We're in it. We're going. And I love that the roof is open because... You said it was beautiful, right? You could see the mountains, the springs, the stars, the everything that's beautiful. God is giving us glimpses of that. We're not in a train with the top covered over, and we can only peek out these windows. No, it's full transparency. God is saying, I'm showing you my glory. And, and people who are focused up here, they're not going to know that there's a spot to jump off at. You know, because if we're supposed to look at him and point at him and point at his glory, we should be so fixated that of what's above, not below. So somehow in this dream, people knew that there was a bridge coming up. And to me, what a bridge means is a transition from one side to the other. So in Church of the Rock's history, I don't know, you know, there's been transitions in this church where people have put on these Life, I don't want to get into that part, but people have jumped off this train, you know, and people here are like, what are you doing? Are you serious? Like, you know, there could be um, leadership. It could be just visitors. It could be somebody that's uh, walking really closely with the Lord, and then they're not going anymore. So um, that could also um, be it. But what I found interesting was you have a life jacket on in a train, you know, makes no sense at all. What are you going to do? Like, is that really going to save you? So that's, that's, and that's something too, was people were putting on things that didn't make sense. So sometimes we have people in our life where we're looking at them and you're like, what are you doing? Like, you're wearing a, like, you might as well be wearing that life jacket on a plane. Like, you you should have a parachute on, not a life jacket. So, like, that makes absolute sense. And they're, they're big, they're cheap, they're orange, they're uncomfortable. Because sometimes when people are living in that sin or choosing that direction in their life, they're choosing to be uncomfortable and, like, it, and choosing to make no sense at all. And it, just, and it blows our minds when we can see somebody in that atmosphere. So that makes me realize that we're, we have the ability, God's giving us that ability to see people who are putting on the life jackets. We can see that. So once we know that they're putting on their life jackets, we know what's next. They're jumping off the dang train. They're jumping off into a cliff. And you saw that it was a sheer cliff. There was no way up and there was no way out. And therefore, if they're jumping, it makes no sense. And I love that, like, your, your need to jump after them, too. It's just like, I'll do whatever it takes. I'll jump off here after them anyways. And it's like... I think God was giving you a glimpse of what was going on when you jump in the water, what happens when people are jumping in the water, because us, where'd they go? You know, we're not, we're not seeing, we're not, we're not jumping off this train. We're not seeing what they're seeing. We're not feeling what they're feeling. So God gave it a really good picture of it. So when, when they hit the water, they thought they knew what would happen when they hit the water. When I hit water, I have this life jacket on, I'm going to float. No. No, because the devil still kill, destroy, deceive. That's what he does. He says, when you hit this water, you'll float. Don't worry, you got this life jacket on. It's the best life jacket ever made. 
no, it's not. It's a cheap piece of crap. And you're going to be sinking to the bottom faster than you ever have because it's not a normal situation. It's not what you think it is. Oh, it's just water. Oh, no, it's different. You're getting off the train. This train is the only thing that's keeping you safe because you have the fellowship. You have the, the camaraderie. You have Jesus. You have, you have the Holy Spirit. You have everything that's on this train. So when Nathan was in the water, he knew that only 75 feet up, he'd be okay. And in this water, what he's lacking is air, and that air is Jesus. So what these people are lacking when they're in this water is Jesus. And if I can just get 75 feet up, I'm going to be okay. So Nathan would have to go into self-preservation to go that 75 feet up. But what did he do? He saw this person, and this person had three faces of his daughter, which means that Oh, if it was just one face, you know, and you had to pick and choose. Well, I like this one better. You know, whatever. It's just like they're, they're all the same. So therefore, God put them all the same into one thing. Because when we look at a lost individual, we need to see our kids. We need to see those people merge together to make us have a heart for them. Because that's what God sees. When he sees this person, he doesn't just see that person. He sees, oh, that's my daughter. That's my son. That's my, that's my beloved. That's who I love. I need to stop. I need to help. I can make it, but I don't want to make it without them. So that's really good. So what do we do? We stop what we're doing. Even though we know we're almost out of air, we go for that one person that we jumped off for. And when you're there, this person has got themselves stuck in this seemingly small thing, and this seemingly, like, that's just attached to the life jacket. You can't pull it out. You can't pull it out. Guess what? When you're ministering to somebody, you can't pull it out. You cannot, because when they put that jacket on, they have to take it off or else they're not going to survive. You can try all you want, you can yell, you can scream, you can cry, but they have to have a revelation of Christ. They have to say, okay, this is not me, it's off. And when that help is there, that help can get them up that 75 feet to fresh air. How can we get them to take off their own jackets? You know what I mean? That's all I have. Yeah. Cool. I hope that helped. I don't know. That's just what I saw on it. Hello. There we go. Uh, So, yeah, I feel like I have a little bit to add to that. And when Nathan shared the dream with me um, at home the morning after he had it, uh, immediately I felt what God was saying to him personally about um, the girl that he couldn't save. But um, but this morning, I, um, I mean, I love what God was speaking to Jesse through the dream, and it's so powerful. And I was sitting there, and I'm like, Lord, I felt like you were showing me something a little bit different. Is it wrong? It, you know, and... Um, I just felt like he was reminding me of his word, you know, and how it's powerful and how it's multifaceted and how we can read one scripture at one point in our life and he can speak one thing to us. And then five years later, we can read it again and he speaks something totally different to us. And so, so this is the other thing I felt like he was speaking through the stream, um, I felt like he was showing me that um, the life jackets are, as believers even, and even the lost, it's our comforts that we trust in, like money, like our retirement, like our jobs, like our house, our car, our spouse, our friendships, those things in our life that make us feel warm and fuzzy and comfortable and like, if I have this, I'm good. And it's not enough. And it will never be enough. And when we choose to look to it as the source, it's going to drag us down. And I felt like in the train you know, was God's purpose and will and his destination for us. We're, we're riding the journey of life with him. He is the journey. He's the journey. And 
we're always tempted to allow other things to weasel their way and take precedence over him. And the enemy is always coming in and saying, this is going to be better. This is going to be greater. This is going to bring more. This is going to bring you peace. This is where you, this is where you want to be, you know, and the people jumping and jumping in the water, um, kind of like Nathan was saying with the girl, like she had the look on her face, like, this is not what I thought it was going to be, you know, like confusion, like, like she was completely confident that she knew what it was going to be. And the enemy can be so deceiving and convincing that, that that thing, that resource, is our source. It should be our source. But, our, but the only source is the Lord, is Jesus. He is the only source. And I just think about that scripture in Proverbs where it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't rely on or lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. And so I just feel like the Lord this morning is wanting to say, and I really, I feel like this applies to all of us, but I really feel like this is something for the teens, especially the young people. I feel like that the Lord is saying not to place your hope and trust in those things of the world. And coming from an old lady up here who's done it, who's done it, who's placed my trust, and who's been in that situation of hopelessness, realizing this is disappointing. This is not what I thought it was going to be. This isn't giving me the joy that, that everything around me told me it was going to give me. He wants to show you that he's the only thing that can fill that hole. He's the only thing that can heal that wound, only him. And he's just saying, look to me. Don't look to the things that the world is saying. This is great. This is fun. This is awesome. This is going to give you everything you ever wanted because that's where we're left, stuck and hopeless. And like Jesse was saying, Jesus is the oxygen. He's the oxygen. And even though Nathan, Nathan couldn't even save that person, even though he had a heart to, He wasn't even enough, but there is one that's enough, and it's Jesus. He's the one that can breathe the breath of life when no one else can. So, yeah. I've got other stuff, but um, I don't think I'm supposed to go to it. Maybe next time. You know, oftentimes... We uh, we mistake God's discipline on our lives for for things that they're not, and God wants to remind us that <clears throat> that He loves us, that His discipline. is not to hurt us, is to bring correction. Hebrews 12, 5 through 8. It says, And have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children? He said, My child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline and don't give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes each one he accepts as his child. As you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you literally as his own children. Whoever heard of a child who is never disciplined by their father. If God doesn't discipline you as he does all of his children, it means that you are illegitimate and not really his children at all. I want to talk to you a little bit about this subject for just one quick second. Because 
I feel like that there's there's maybe people that have have viewed God as their own earthly father whenever their own earthly father isn't a good father who doesn't truly treat you the way that our heavenly father treats you but you have this vision you have this perception that that's how your heavenly father is guys that's not the case it's not the case if you view your father your heavenly father god the father the creator of everything and you think that that he is just like your earthly father and that's why you can't accept love from him and you can't accept um correction from him and you can't connect with him guys i want to tell you he's not like your earthly father even if you've had the best earthly father that's ever existed, that best earthly father, that dad, that, that figure that you love so much, he pales in comparison to the, to the true love of our heavenly father. Pales in comparison. No matter if he's the best earthly father or the worst earthly father. The Heavenly Father loves you so much, and His correction isn't to beat you down. It's not to, to harm you. It's to discipline you so that you change your, your actions. To become more like Him. The Bible talks about chastening. It talks about instruction. It talks about chastisement. All of these different things, they're, they're made for education purposes, for training purposes. Disciplinary correction is what it is. It's to give us instruction. But listen to this. It's to nurture us. To nurture us. I know that can be hard to, to wrap our minds around sometimes. There were times where I got disciplined as a child, and I'm like, I'm never going to do that to my kids. They may need a little more of it. (laughs) But I needed a little more of it, too. The whole training and education of children, it relates to the cultivation of mind and morals and employs for this purpose now commands and admonishes admonition now reproof and punishment guys it's god doesn't bring correction to hurt us he brings correction to to make us more like him and i just want to encourage you to don't get um, don't get things confused. It's okay to go through correction from God because it's going to bring forth things that are truly going to help you. I just really feel like that that a lot of us struggle with having the proper perception of of who God is and and especially whenever it relates to him as our father. So I ask you guys to to be praying about that. Ask God to give you a true revelation of who he is, especially as a father. Now, some of you may be thinking, this is an interesting service today. You know, we heard from multiple people, um, none of which were even senior pastor. And I think that's a good thing. You know? I love hearing from you guys. Because I grow from you guys. God didn't give me the revelation of what this, what this dream meant. But he gave different revelations to a couple of you. And, and, you know, he probably even gave different revelation to multiple of you. And if you feel like that that you want to come up and, and share that with me, 
you know, feel free. Please feel free. No matter who you are. If you're a first time guest, if you've been here since the start of Church on the Rock, if you're a kid, young, old, God's going to use us all. All of us. So don't hesitate. Be obedient and let God use you. I want to ask you guys to, to think about who you are on that train. Picture yourself. Where are you sitting? Are you going to stay on it? Were you thinking about jumping? Were you preparing to jump? That's all right. And what's God saying the train is to you? Might be a different train. I don't know. Hopefully it's on the same tracks, though. Let me pray for you guys and for me. Pray for all of us. We'll close with one more worship song, and uh, we'll be up here for prayer. I'll be up here. If anybody else wants to come up, please feel free. And uh, I hope you guys got got a lot to think about today. But if you want to stay in a place of worship, you can. Um, don't feel like you need to stay. If you have kids in children's ministry, don't forget to pick them up. Heavenly Father, good morning. God, we love you. God, we thank you, Lord, that you speak to us. Thank you, God, that we can come into your presence. Thank you for sending your Holy Spirit, and you never leave us. You never forsake us. God, open our eyes to what you're doing in our lives in the lives of people around us. Help us to be obedient to you and do what you tell us to do no matter what it is. God, I pray that we as, as this local body here, that this church, this church on the rock, God, help us to be obedient to you. Help us to do what you tell us to do, when you tell us to do it, where you tell us to do it. No matter, no matter what that looks like, even if it makes us fearful, God, help us to remember that you are our strength. You are our ever-present help in time of need. Help us to know that you go before us and you prepare the way for us, God. And even when what you're, what you're telling us to do is scary, God, help us to just hold on to you tighter and just step and just do it, regardless of the outcome, trusting that you have our best interest in mind. God, help us to love on people outside of these four walls here. Help us to show people you. Help us to show people the love of Christ and draw people in because you first loved us. Help us to represent you well in everything that we do, God. Help us to not accept condemnation, Lord, but help us to receive your conviction about your righteousness and who you are in us, God, and what you've done for us. Let us use that as fuel that burns us, burns us bright, God, and sends us out into this world to set it on fire for you. God, I pray that you'll continue to pour out revelation in us and to us and through us, God. Help us to love others like we love you, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.